Okay, time to start lecture 8.2 of the Domain Specific Languages of Mathematics course. Uh, here we will connect a bit of uh, different chapters. So one is power series from week 5. One is complex numbers from already week 1. Vector spaces from week 7. And a little bit of Laplace transforms from week 8. So um, first a reminder. We've expressed the exponential function sine and cosine as power series over a general field A. So field here it could be reals, but it could also be rationals or other data types. And remember we did this by basically solving the integral equation here. So we integrate starting at 1, the exponential function, and then we get the exponential function. So this fills in recursively all the infinity many coefficients of the exp function. Similar to sine and cosine are defined mutually recursively. Sine defined in terms of cosine, cosine in terms of minus sine. Okay, and then a reminder that we have also defined previous week vector spaces. So we introduced a scaling operator. This is pronounced scale. Um, and this class the vector space class relates two types, V for vectors and S for scalars. So S has to be a field and V only needs to be an additive group. And then we have this asymmetric operator of scaling, taking a scalar, a vector, and well, making it longer or shorter or even reflecting it if it's a negative scalar. And sometimes it's convenient to have letters instead of symbols. So scale is this. And this also shows what the type it is. So here it is in, inside the class. And here it's sort of um, sitting by itself. So if V and S are uh, the types in a vector space, then this asymmetric type taking a scalar and a vector to a vector is what scaling is doing. So this was a reminder, but now let's view a power series data type as a vector space. And this we do by instantiating the vector space type class where vectors are power series. And this is generic for any type A, which is a field. So for example, real numbers. So the scalars is the A's and also the A's serve as components in the power series, the coefficients. And this means that I have to define the scaling operator because as you may remember, power series, we already have a zero and we already have addition. So the additive class, which is required here, additive group even, is already filled in. So we have additive, uh, addition, subtraction and zero. Okay, so how do we add scaling? So we get a constant C and we want to implement a way of transforming the power series representation uh, of a function uh, and the result should be c times that function. So specification wise if we have a polynomial that is represented so if p is equal to the evaluation of a certain power series a s then we would like to start from uh, this one to the function so if this is the function, uh, then we want c times p of x, the function x to c times p of x as the result. And if we take some example here, let's say the polynomial is um, 1 plus x plus x squared. Then we can see that if we want c times uh, everything, then we can distribute this in and say this is c times 1, it's c times, well, <laughs> c times, the, so it's c times uh, also, well, let, let's put it this, it, it's c plus c times x plus c, c times x squared and so on. So all the coefficients have been multiplied by c. So, well, if we generalize this, this is without the proof now, then what we want to do is to transform all the coefficients by the same factor. 
So we can say if we have a function map p, which transforms all the coefficients by some function, then we can take c times as the function. Okay, at least that type checks. So what is then map p? Well, it's the generalization of the usual list map. If you have a function from a to b, you should take a power series of a's to a power series of b. So it doesn't have to change the type. For example, here we don't change the type, but in general it could. And what does this do? Well, it takes a function, it takes a power series uh, of some coefficients, and then it returns a power series where you do map f over the list. So remember, internally, a power series is just a list of coefficients. So by implementing scaling in this way, we have now power series as a vector space. You may wonder what are the base vectors of this vector space, and we can choose them in different ways. But one way is to say that um, base vector, let's call it e, uh, EP. So for every index, um, which is actually here, every natural number, we should have a base vector. So this can be defined in different ways, but if we do it the sort of simplest way for this type, then EP of i. Let's give a type first. This should take, well, it should be a natural number, but I haven't imported that type. So let's say it takes an int. I think I've imported int. Um, and it should return a power series. And let's add a constraint later. later. So the base vector for coefficient i should be something like a power series with 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 and then just zeros. So we could write it uh, in Haskell with repeat uh, zero and then a one and then uh, repeat zero afterwards. Uh, and I won't, uh, as I won't use it in this lecture, I won't define it here, but it's a good exercise to fill this one in. Actually, I can just move it outside of the code block. Uh, so filling in the base vectors could be useful if you want to write some linear transformations later. Okay, so now we have a vector space of uh, instance for power series. Um, let's see, you started this lecture saying that we wanted to also connect to complex numbers. So let's see. First, as a reminder, complex numbers, uh, they're basically a pair of two real numbers. Uh, but we don't have to uh, be fixed to real numbers here. So I'll put a type parameter r instead of real, so that if we instantiate, so normal complex number would be complex real. But it could, but we also could have complex rational, etc. Okay, just quickly, uh, let's implement some helper functions here. So if we have an x and a, and whatever inside, the intention is that the real part should be x. Similarly, oops, if we have whatever followed by y, then that part should be the imaginary part. So now we have a real part extractor, so we can get out. Um, let's close these to get a little more space. Um, I, well, this is the complex number, real part zero, imaginary part one. Okay, so that's fine. And you see here it's parameterized for any ring. So we can, for example, say that I want a complex real or I want a complex rational. I may also have a complex int. Okay, I haven't imported int integer perhaps. Yeah. So it's not perhaps the type we often use um, in calculus, but it actually has interesting properties and can be used in uh, number theory. So complex integer is just a, a two, two integers which transform according to the same multiplication addition laws as uh, it would if it were reals. Okay, uh, to 
instance, you take different classes for complex numbers. We need a zero, which is clearly zero, zero. We need addition, which will match on two complex numbers, x1, y1, and complex number x2, y2, and return the complex number x1 plus x2 and y1 plus y2. So addition is done component-wise, as for many other types. And at this point, we can make this instance additive, which means that now I can write i plus i, and that's the complex number 0, 0,2. Actually, that's the, the int integer instance. OK. Now we can also make complex numbers a vector space. So the power series, that was an infinite dimensional vector space. Here we got the two dimensional vector space, whoops, space over the scalars A. So, well, we claim we have it and we say that it's a function scale C, but let's see if we can actually implement it. So scale C, should take a constant c of the underlying type a and then it should multiply the complex number by this. And if you remember the complex numbers, they are often viewed as two-dimensional vectors in the plane and multiplying or scaling with the constant is just making it longer, this vector, which means it should multiply the x-coordinate and the y-coordinates. But we can do that uh, directly, but we can also use the same pattern as we did up here, that scaling was mapping. So I will use that down here. So I'll say this is actually map C, a function I would have to define, of C multiplied. So you can see that this is actually the same um, form of the function, that just map P is changed to map C here. Then, of course, I need to implement map C. So if we have a function f and a complex number x, y, then I should apply the function f to both components. In this case, it was multiply both components by c. So this is then a complex number f of x, f of y. OK, nice. So now we have at least from the Haskell point of view, created a two-dimensional vector space. And here we can also think about base vectors. So let's say uh, the base vector for complex numbers 1 and the base vector for complex numbers 2. Uh, both, well, okay, let's copy. So both of these should be complex A. And what the natural way to define it here is say that this is actually the complex number 1, 0, and this is the, the corresponding, uh, the other complex number 0, 1. But we already have a name for this, so let's just say i. And actually, this one is also, we, we, we should have a name for this one. Oh, by the way, it complains. So see, possible fix, add group, yes. So this is not for any type A, as I'm using um, 0 and 1. Actually, it should be more than add group. But OK, uh, I think I will need to have a ring here. So let's put that directly, because that's stronger than what it's asking for. OK, so it, it doesn't complain here. So that should work. And uh, let's get back to where we were. Uh, this one, we can also write as 1 if we just define what 1 is. And I will do that a little further below. So this is the embedding the real number 1, and this is embedding the imaginary direction 1. So those are the two base vectors. And as we know, every complex number, so every complex number z can be written as, well, usually you say z equals x plus i times y, but here 
as we look now at these two as base vectors here it should be z equals scale by x so remember here x and y should be of type real or well the underlying type a so scale by x the ec1 and then add scale by y ec2 okay let's let's at least check if uh, this can type check so this probably needs to be a function then of x and y if we want to make sure that all the things are defined ec ah they were capital c's ec1 and ec2 okay so let's see what the type of our z is oh okay <laughs> it it doesn't know that these two vector spaces are the same so let's let's put it uh, be a little more helpful here so let's say that this takes two numbers of type a and produces a complex uh, a but we also need to be a little more specific because scaling requires multiplicative uh, so multiplicative a oh i see i use the general scale i should say scale c to not confuse matters too much Yeah, okay, and multiplicative A is not enough. Complex also needs to be um, an additive group. Let's see, EC1 complex A. Ah, I required a ring up there, so this also needs to be a, a ring. Oops. Okay, so that's fine. So now the type of, uh, sorry, the type of Z here is a to a to complex a but actually uh, maybe it's should this not z but embed so this embeds um, two real numbers for example as a complex number um, or represent or something like that and another a test we could write is that if we start uh, prop complex if we start from a complex number We should be able to uh, let's do it this way. So prop com complex. If we take the real and imaginary parts out and then put them back in, so if we take any complex number z and then we check is embed real part of z, imaginary part of z equal to z, and then clearly it will require equality checking and uh, yes it will require also the underlying thing to be at least a ring we don't use division here so we don't need a field okay so embed no sorry prop complex i for example oh uh, yes, so we, we, we should be able to test this, but we can't yet because we've used one here and we haven't defined it. We have defined i, but not one. So let's move slightly below and um, continue defining the operations. Negate um, can be written now using map C of negate, so negating both components and um, one is just the complex number one zero as we mentioned above okay good now we should be able to test the property yeah okay so it's true for i and it's probably true for other numbers as one um, there's not much scope for doing something wrong there okay uh, let's move on in uh, building the instances here. So multiplication of complex number. Here I will copy some code from the definition of addition because the patterns is similar. So multiplication. 
takes two numbers and then it should return a complex numbers real and imaginary parts where and then I have to define what these are real equals and imag equals and we went through this before and let's see if I can reconstruct it here so the real part comes from two sources it's x1 times x2 the two real parts and it's the other source is one y1 times y2 but this is actually times i squared which is equal to minus one which means instead of addition here we can use subtraction so the real part is the two first minus the two second components and the imaginary parts well that's when i do the mixed multiplication so x1 times y2 and x2 times y1 those are both imaginary parts and there's addition there we've looked at it before so i won't go through it here uh, what we haven't defined before um, is the division for complex numbers so we need a definition of recip so let's do a little bit of a comment here so recip of the complex number so let's let's first here sort of uh, do it sort of mathematically so we, we want to choose a plus i b because that's slightly shorter and we'd be converted later recipe of a plus i b i'll use some equation reasoning that's equal to one divided by a plus i b well this in turn um, we can multiply above and below by so this comment here is multiply by a minus ib actually strictly speaking i'm multiplying by a minus ib divided by a minus ib so from this one i get one such factor below the devotion sign and one such factor above so that should not change the value. And then we can start simplifying this. Simplify. We, we recognize that we've got IB with plus and IB with minus. We can use the conduit rule. So this is A squared plus, no, actually minus IB squared. So then I, this just from, um, Simplify using x plus y times x minus y equals x squared minus y squared. Oh, yeah, I can use the Unicode too there. <laughs> okay, so I use that and then simplify again. Uh, now I'm going to use that i squared is minus 1. So this is b squared and minus minus becomes plus. Uh, so there is no i left. It's just a squared plus b squared under the division sign here. Okay. But the interesting part here is that this part here is actually a real number. So a squared is a real number. b squared is a real number. And I can add them up and get a real number. I can even take one over. Uh, I can uh, actually rewrite this to... This is multiplied by the recip of this well the recip real sort of of this but we have to be a little bit careful and that's typically when we do sort of math like reasoning here then there's usually some type information lost so we want to write basically this so the the real reciprocal of this real number times the complex number a minus ib but notice that this multiplication operator then would have type real to comp well let's write it like this to complex to complex so it is an asymmetric operator and it's not actually the multiplication operator it's the scaling so strictly speaking this is not multiply but it's actually scale c of this complex number and then if we also want um, 
if we want the data types to be correct here, this is actually C of uh, A comma negate B. And the original number we started from is recip of C of A comma B. Okay, so now we've sort of argued for the computation here. So this uh, part we can put as a pattern on the left hand side. And this part, maybe simplify slightly, we can put on the right hand side. So it's a little long, so I'll take this part here and say, call it uh, F or C for a coefficient. Um, and this C is then equal to the real reciprocal of A squared plus B squared. And I don't, I don't have a real reciprocal, but I just have the recip, which is the reciprocal for reals if used on A and B. Well, actually reciprocal in the A type, so the field A. Okay, now there were several uh, risks of doing something wrong here. So let's try to see what recip actually done, does. So recip I. Hmm, that looks promising. I mean, uh, 1 over i is actually the same as minus i. And we can check it by multiplying i by recip i, and that's 1. We can even check, is this equal to 1? And that's true. Okay, let's do some other case. Uh, let's do um, 1 plus 1 plus i squared divided by 1 plus i, 1 plus i. So that should also be 1 plus i, because I can just uh, reduce the exponent here. And you see, it's one real part and one imaginary part. So this does actually seem to compute the correct number. Uh, maybe we should have something where it's not quite as even. I mean, what is actually one, oh, what is recip then of 1 plus i? Okay, so then it's uh, real part half, imaginary part minus half. And we can check if we multiply this by 1 plus i, we should get 1, 0. I mean, we should get 1. The, the, the units in the multiplicative uh, instance. Okay, nice. So by now we've implemented, we've noted the power series, which we implemented before, were also a vector uh, space and also that uh, complex number. We've implemented all the operations, including the scaling for a vector space, space. And now let's see if we can connect this to some interesting helper functions or other functions. So here I've taken the power series representation of x, sine and cosine evaluate them up to 30 terms and call the resulting functions from s to s, x f, sine f and cos f. And notice that these are defined for any field. And I've now defined complex numbers to be a field. So I can apply, for example, my exponential function to i. It's not restricted to real numbers. It can do th stuff with complex numbers. I can apply it to what, whichever complex number I want. So let's see, what did I get out here? What is EI? Okay, so that's a combination of two numbers. Let's, let's put it here and see if we can uh, compare it. So if we also com uh, compute what is complex C1 there, cosine, and if we line it up, we recognize that this is to all the decimals the same. So this was, this first one was EI. This was C1. Okay, and let's also compute S1. So S1 equals, as you can see, E1, EI is actually equal to C of C1, S1. I'm not sure if this is 
true to all the decimal places, but let's check. Yes, it's even true to all the decimal places. So when computing the exponential function at i, I accidentally computed both the cosine and the sine function. And well, this is not an accident. Uh, this is a very nice property of the exponential function. So notice that we define the exponential function first. First, we, we sort of define it for real numbers. And then we said, well, actually, we can make it work for any field. And we didn't have much uh, interesting fields around. We had uh, real numbers, we had rational numbers. But now when we made complex an instance, we can also try to compute exactly the same exactly the same power series so just you know this is uh, this is 1 plus i plus uh, what is it i squared over 2 plus and so on i to the power of 3 over 6 and so on it, it's just uh, a sum of these terms and uh, for some reason it sort of uh, conspires to be the same as what sine and cosine is doing. And I will not prove it here, but it's a general property. Um, so let's try to, instead of proving it, um, compute it to more than just this particular case, EI. And to do that, let's relate the power series. And then I will do it in two steps. I will first define a helper function, xA. So exp a is supposed to be e to the power, it's defined here. So exp a of a number, a real number a and a, a position x is exp of a times x. Well, actually it doesn't require a to be real here. It's just any field, but a factor a. So this is e to the power of 2x or e to the power of 5x or e to the power of i x. So then the derivative rule for exponential function we know is such that if we have an inner derivative of just a here, the derivative of exponential function would return the exponential function, whoops, uh, return the exponential function multiplied by the inner derivative, which here is just a. And we can also compute the value of the exp a a at zero, and that's a times zero in the exponent, which becomes zero, so this is just one. And when we have this, when we know what the derivative is and the value at zero is, then we can solve using integ p. So we can say that if we give a parameter a here, so this is a family of power series. For every a, we got one power series. So for each uh, such a, a, we get an integ p starting at 1, actually 1, and then, well, what is the derivative? It's a times um, exp a a. And let's try to see if this works. Well, okay, parse error and input. Uh, I had put this accidentally, not as a comment. Okay, now it complains a curse check cannot construct the infinite type a equals ps of a. And the problem is here that I've been a bit lax in my typing. The expression in the mathematics side, notice I said the derivative of x a applied to x is this. So this expression, if we expand this, or, or rather if we want to drop the x here, then this, this is a times x Hmm, it's sort of, it, you could write it as const a times exp a, where this multiplication is the fun function multiplication. So it's basically a mal f of const a and exp a a. But more naturally is to look at it as scaling. So this is actually scale p a of exp a. a. So multiply the power series by a. So the derivative, the thing we should have here, is not the derivative applied to a certain point. It should be the general derivative. So this multiplication should actually be scaling. It should be the, the vector space operation. Let's see if this is liked better. Yes. 
So if, if you want to recognize this expression here, I could, so this, you could also write it as scale a exp a, or if you want to be type specific, it's the scale p. That's Haskell is actually picking out. Okay, um, either of these definitions works and they give the same result. So we, we integrate starting at one of a times the exponential function. Okay, and now we can get back x. I, I, I want to define x i as this um, uh, special case when a is i. So here I want to call x a with i as the parameter. And now we may have to think about the types here. So this says, if I get a type a in, I will get a ps of a. Now this, oops, sorry, this, the i here is of type complex of a, which means I will get a ps where the a are complex numbers. So now I have moved from sort of the example of real numbered uh, or rational numbered power series to the coefficients all being complex numbers. Okay, interesting. So anyway, this, this is just a definition. Let's see what we get if we take some values from it. Take uh, P8 from X I. Okay, it's maybe not all that readable. Let's make it a power series of rational. Uh, oh, sorry. It's power series of complex numbers, but we can make it a complex rationals. Okay, this may this may actually be slightly readable, especially if we break some lines and line it up a bit. If I replace all the commas by comma return no. The commas by comma return space space. This was a little bit too hard. I'm trying to line these two up so that we can see what we've got. What are the complex numbers in this series? Okay, so remember what we've got here is a power series with coefficients. This is the real part of each comp uh, complex number coefficient and this is the imaginary part. So first we can notice that every second is zero. So actually it might be easier to see if we replace 0% 1 by 0. Uh, we can also replace in the same vein 1% 1, 1 by 1. Oops, this was a little too eager. 1 over 120 became, almost became wrong there. Okay, so what is the series? So the real part has 1, 0, minus a half, 0, 124, and so on. And the imaginary part has 0, 1, 0, minus 1, 6, 0, and so on. Okay, now, as I know what the answer will be, I will also try to define cosine plus i times sine. So we have the power series. Uh, remember if I take here, oh, I should keep the type signature. So the cosine power series. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't, I don't need to make this complex, just the power series of rational numbers. So this is 1, 0, minus a half, 0, 1, 24, 0, and so on. So 1, 0, minus a half, 0, 1, 24. So by ocular, ops, <laughs> by checking, looking at these, you can see that you actually get, as the real part, the power series for cosine, as the imaginary part, the power series for sine. And let's see if we can express, I said, that implement cosine plus i sine. Well, this doesn't have the right type. There are several reasons why it doesn't. So first, let's use cosine p and sine p, the power series here. Yeah, and still it doesn't like it because it's i multiply. And then you say, should think, okay, what multiplication is this? 
So i multiplied by a power series. i is a complex number and the power series, well, that's not a complex number. So this is an asymmetric use of multiplication. So it's actually the vector space operation scaling here. Okay, let's see. Now it says there is a potential, it, there's some confusion here. Um, the type is ambiguous. The type of which is ambiguous. Yeah, okay, Let, let's let's help it a little bit and say this, we, we know that this is a scaling for the power series. And then it's happy. So I'm not sure exactly where it uh, finds its uncertainty, but you know the i here is a very power polymorphic value in itself, and sine p is also polymorphic, so there might be a little too many choices. So anyway, what we've done here is to treat the i as a scalar. So the complex number i is a scalar, sine p as a vector, and then we added it to the other vector, cos p. Okay, and now. We've got two possibilities here. Uh, we got we got the cos cos p sin p, uh, which is now not and it, now it's a complex rational power series, and then well it's it's maybe not that easy to see. Um, well, it's fairly easy to see the same, but we can do better than that. We can actually check if these are equal. Uh, what was the previous one here? Take eight. So I, I'm not checking equality of the full power series because remember they are infinite and that would take a lot of time. Yeah, and okay, it doesn't think that uh, the Boolean is a complex rational. Ooh, okay. Now I don't have an instance for equality here. So let's see where I forgot that one. So deriving eq i did that for complex but probably not for power series and it's sort of reasonable not to do it for power series because it's an infinite type so maybe i should just extract uh, the two lists here um, or just let let's implement our own equality for for power series so eq p of two power series p Poly, no, it was just P A S P B S. And let's take N steps here because we can't do it optimally. We can't uh, compute the whole list equality. So this equality should take an integer and then two power series and produce a Boolean. And actually we need to be able to check equality of the elements. So what I intend to do here is to just check if take n a s equals take n b s. Oops. Oh, the type for for um, for take is not integer but int. Okay. Let's, let's move this uh, test as well. So the test here is basically take p. So now it's our own ek p. And I don't need to take p now because that will be taking care of the equality. So take eight terms out of x e i and cos p i. I think I will need to give it a specific type. Okay, so what is test? Test is true, yes. Oh, lots of work there. But the the nice thing uh, is that we can. Well, test is just test is just a boolean. We can implement um, and check equality. This is not a proof, but still, it's a pretty convincing one. The test that we can represent. Uh, we can to take the exponential function of i, and it will get the same as the cosine and the sine added up. And it's also a little bit of a fun use of the fact that we've implemented a vector space here. So for the last part, uh, for the rest of the lecture, I will go over to, to the Jamboard and that's where I will stop here and um, take a break.